Welcome back to Let's Code. I'm Chris Biscardi, and today we're going to talk a little bit about shaders in Bevy Engine. Now, on the right hand side here, I've got a cube, and on the left hand side, I've got a WGSL uh, shader, which is just a fragment shader. So we write a fragment function, which we'll get into. And then we've got, of course, our Bevy application on the other tab here. So so let's start out with the actual Bevy application itself. We've got a clear color here, which sets the background color to this blue. We use all the default plugins. If you watched the last video on shaders, you'll know that I built a uh, WGSL library for sharing different noise functions around and put it into a Bevy plugin. That's this shader utils plugin right here. And then we add a new custom material. Custom material is our struct, but material plugin is a name that comes from the Bevy prelude. Then we've got three functions here. We've got a setup function to set up all of our cubes and cameras and things like that. We've got this change color function, and then we've got the movement function. And the movement function, um, I think I can just show it to you. I think it's still working. Yeah, so it doesn't do much right now, but I'm gonna use this in a second to uh, show off different colors. So that just moves our, our cube up, down, left, right, that kind of thing. So in our setup function, we create a new material mesh bundle. This is really important. This is the cube that we are setting up to apply our shader to. The mesh is going to be a cube with a size of one. We could make this any size we want to, and it will, you know, change the size of the cube. Surprise. We put it at something that is slightly off of center, and it's slightly off of center just because sometimes things happen when you're writing programs. If it's exactly at zero, 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 it may coincidentally work, but if it's slightly off, offset, you may uh, actually notice something goes wrong and then are able to fix it. And then we add our custom material, which is just a struct into the materials. Uh, materials, as you can see up here, is a mutable asset database uh, pointing at our custom materials. So this is basically handle IDs to any custom materials that we've put in. Uh, in this case, we only have the one custom material. So anytime you see this, it's gonna be <laughs> basically a pointer to that single custom material. We also use time here. Uh, we use time here because this animation that's happening on the right is using Perlin noise and Perlin noise is animated really well if we use the time value. Now we can do all sorts of things like loop the time value back to get a looping dip and et cetera. But basically we're using time as the you know third dimension of Perlin noise so that these X, Y values or whatever we put in here um, can animate over time. Of course, we have our movable component here, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. That's the, again, this cube can move in different ways. And that's the component that we target uh, to decide what can move when we hit the arrow keys. And then we spawn in a 3D camera bundle looking at this cube. We need to have this camera because otherwise we'll never see anything. Uh, the change color function is really poorly named, which is why I didn't describe it earlier. Uh, it actually just updates the time. <laughs> <laughs> so for every custom material that we have in our uh, assets database for custom materials, we iterate over it in a mutable way and we set the time uh, to the second since startup. And we set it as an F32 because uh, in WGSL, I've found that uh, F32s kind of work really well. Now we get to the interesting part. We've implemented the material trait for our custom material struct. And our custom material struct uh, just has time and alpha mode. Alpha mode really isn't important. It could even not be in this example and uh, everything would probably work just the same. But when we implement material, we get to specify any of a set of about five functions that we can override or we get the default. So in this case, we override the fragment shader, which is basically when people think about shaders, they think, oh, it's uh, changing the color of things. And this is the way that you change the color of things. Now there are, you know, other shaders, there's compute shaders and vertex shaders and uh, stuff like that. But for now, we're just covering fragment shaders. So we uh, specify shaders custom material WGSL, which we have right here. That is in our assets folder in our Bevy project. And uh, that's what applies our shader to the cube. Now this UUID here for our custom materials just randomly created. I think I copied and pasted another one and then modified a couple of the actual letters. Um, we, der we derive a couple of different uh, things here. The as bind group is one of the most important because that defines how our data is going to actually get from Rust and into our WGSL shader. Now, when we're working with shaders, we basically have an input buffer and an output buffer. Material and the immaterial trait in Bevy is really new. 
you have to be using the main branch to have access to this right now. But it's a very high level API, which means that Bevy will take care of things like formatting our structs into the right sizes and things for uh, the input buffer so that our shader can then operate on that input buffer and then output some color or something like that. Now, uniform is uh, something I'll go over when we get into the shader itself, the WGSL script. Uh, but just remember that this zero is really important and uniform basically just means we have a value. And then of course, before we get into WGSL, we've got this movable struct that we've derived component on because we've inserted it onto the cube and we iterate over everything that has a mu mu yeah. We iterate over everything that has movable on it uh, and we get those transforms and then we iterate we set the direction and we, you know, move it up, down, left or right. We don't move on the Z axis at all. Um, so that'll affect some of the visuals that we get later, but you could change that if you wanted to. And then of course we do some kind of little bit of skewing here um, to make sure that dependent on the, not the number of frames, but the Delta seconds here, um, it actually moves the same amount, whether we have a lot of frames, a little frame, that kind of thing. So basically this is all just set up so that we can have a, shader in a WGSL script applied to the cube and that that shader also gets the time value. Now, right at the top here, um, our custom material inside of the shader, this looks very similar to Rust, which I really like. So this custom material gets the time as an F32 and then inside of group one binding zero. Remember before when we had our uniform attribute macro on our uh, custom material, we defined the binding ID as zero. This is an arbitrary number. It doesn't matter what it is as long as it's unique. In almost all of the examples that I've seen and written, uh, this is an ever incrementing number. So it goes from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. And then we set basically the input buffer that we're getting uh, to this material. Now, Bevy is doing things behind the scenes, so that's not strictly accurate, but you can think of it like that. And then we write our fragment function. This is the sort of really important piece. This uses WGSL. WGSL is the uh, WebGPU shading language. Uh, there's a nice giant spec here if you want to read it. I think that when I was reading it, the most useful pieces that I, uh, or the, the pieces that I found the most useful are the built-in functions. So in here we have uh, logical functions, array functions, functions on floats, for example, normalize, we've got saturate, we've got smooth step, which will uh, run into if you start looking into the actual implementation of Perlin noise and things like that. We've got sine and tangent and square root and all, all those really cool things. We've also got some really, I don't know how to phrase this. We've got some advanced stuff like the partial derivatives uh, functions here uh, so that we don't actually have to write the partial derivative. We can just give it <laughs> the thing. Um, we've also got some texture functions here that are super useful, but uh, that's about all we're going to get into for right now. I would say that reading this is kind of dry and overall doesn't really help that much. So if you don't want to read the spec, don't worry about it. Just look at the functions here and um, the Rust WGPU crate, which is what Bevy is using. The Rust WGPU crate will actually have all of those functions implemented. There's a new version coming. So the syntax that we're going over today, I will have to go over again, specifically if you start reading the spec, if I can get back to the spec, you'll see this at symbol a lot in our code. We end up writing uh, these square brackets a lot. And the at symbol tends to replace those square brackets in our code. So there's a couple of changes. They're mildly breaking. You will have to rewrite any WGSL stuff that you write. Um, maybe that will get upgraded for 0 0.8. I think there's a PR in Bevy right now for that to happen. I hope it does, but 0 0.8 is coming out, I think, within the next week or two, um, if I'm reading all of the PRs and stuff correctly. So it may or may not land, <laughs> we'll see. But let's go over a little bit of the WGSL shader that we've got here. So we've got animated Perlin noise basically. And the function or the uh, values that we're using are the coord.x, coord.y, and coord.c. And then we are, in addition to those, using material.time. Now you'll see this is very streaky, right? Like there are very definitive horizontal and vertical lines here. That's because coord is actually the position of the cube, I believe. So we don't actually, um, or we aren't getting the position of each individual fragment here. We're getting the position of uh, the entire cube itself. 
So the like the root point that we've placed this at. So coordinate x, y, and z don't change. We divide those by 50 just because that's the uh, increment that I chose to use. And then we use time as well. So we've got three basically Perlin noise twos that take vec twos, one for each of the uh, x, y, and z coordinate. And then we normalize that from, because the noise values are negative one to one, we want that to be somewhere between zero and one. So we add one and divide by two, and that gives us something between zero and one. We do that for value one, two, and three, and then we use that as a vec four of F32s in our return uh, value. And that gives us this. So over time, the values change, and it gives us this nice uh, glowy cube guts going on here. Now, I actually haven't done this yet, so I just want to see what this does before we move on. I am going to use world position in a second. Okay, that's fun. So this is really fun. Uh, we get a little bit more of a gradiented cube if we take the world position. So the world position is going to be the position of the fragment in world space, I believe, anyway. <laughs> um, one person that was really helpful was uh, Loomis or Looms. I'm not sure how to pronounce this because I've only ever uh, written <laughs> back and forth with them. But they let me know about this wonderful file inside of Bevy. So inside of the Bevy repo at Bevy creates Bevy PBR, which is one of the crates for uh, rendering sort of realistic textures and stuff like that. Source render mesh.wgsl. And if we look in render, actually, there's a bunch of WGSL stuff in here. Uh, I've also been playing around with uh, the PBR bindings and things like that. But if we go into mesh.wgsl, that gives us this file. Now, this defines input and output types for the vertex shaders and also the fragment shaders. So we need to scroll down and find the fragment input. And the fragment input will give us this world position. So at location zero, we've got a world position that is a VEC4 of F32s. At location one, we've got a world normal. If vertex UVs is set, then we will also have UVs at location two, and then some other things as well. So this is super useful just to know uh, and know the location of this file. So thank you to Looms for pointing that out for me. I was, I was reading the spec trying to find where these were defined, and I couldn't find them. Uh, and then we've got basically the uh, default fragment shader which we are replacing. So if we go back to our code, all I've done is I've replaced the uh, coordinate of the entire cube, which we were dividing by 50 with the world position. Remember our cube is only one unit wide. So this is only going to be uh, between zero and one for us, which gives us this really nice smooth gradient. And we are also doing material.time still. So we've got a vec2 for each of the X, Y, and Z world positions in our fragment shader. And that's what gives us this really, really nice sort of smooth animated gradient uh, uh, that I really like. Honestly, I'm really happy with that. Um, that said, let's comment this out for a second and talk about kind of what the world position actually looks like. So if we don't use any of the Perlin noise and we run this again, you can see that the actually it would have been fun to move the cube. We'll go back and do that in a second. So you can see that the world position here is uh, pretty well defined. Like if we move up and down, you can see where blues start, blacks end, and so on and so forth. You can see fairly specifically that this spot right in the middle here is probably zero, zero, where everything kind of intersects. Uh, remember, we're not moving against the Z coordinate. So uh, we aren't moving basically forward and back. We're only moving up and down and left and right. And you can just see where all of these start to change. Now, we don't necessarily have a lot of interestingness here um, just because the world position is only going to be so many things. And we're not looping it back on itself, so it's not like repeating over the world or anything like that. But I just wanted to point out that it does, in fact, uh, we can, in fact, map the world position directly to RGB and display that on our cube. So before we move forward, I'm going to go back and do the thing that I wanted to, which is, so now we've got this uh, smoothly animated. And if we move it over here, we get slightly different results because different colors exist in different spots because we're mapping the world position onto this cube. So if we change where the cube is, we do get different colors in each place, which is really fun. All right, enough, enough of that. <laughs> let's comment out that and let's take a look at the normal. The normals is super interesting. So we don't just get the world position and we don't just get the position of the cube, which is a built-in. 
uh, which I found in the spec. We also get the normals and the UV. So normals is super interesting because it will show us the direction of each cube face. So in this case, I believe the normals are uh, zero or one, maybe. I think it's zero and one, at least from my from my experiments, it is. Like if we move this, the color isn't going to change because these are the, the world space normals, if I remember correctly. So you can see that the uh, X, Y, and Z are mapped to R, G, and B. So this is a VEC4. We can put arbitrary data in here, but currently it's being interpreted as a color. So we've got R, G, and B. In this case, we've got 0, 0, 1, which is this face facing us. The top face looks like it would be 0, 1, 0. So this is the normals. And then the black face is probably something like 0, 0, 0. And we can't spin the cube, so I can't show you anything else because I didn't code that up. But I just wanted to point out that it is, in fact, possible to target specific faces by using these normals values. So if you wanted to, say, target the face that's facing the camera, you could target the normals.z uh, equals 1.0. And then, of course, there's a UV value. Now, I didn't do uh, anything that wasn't complicated for the UV space. Ooh, did I mess that up? I messed that up. This is also what happens if you don't do things correctly. Uh, what did I mess up? Parsing error, no definition of scope for identifier value three. What did I do for value three? Value three is the, I guess we're gonna be using world position here. I didn't realize I was using one of those values. So we're gonna use the world position.z through its own Berlin noise two. And then we're gonna take the U and the V coordinate, which I'll show you in a second. And we're gonna throw those through their own. And now we've got this cube that is still a rainbowish cube. But you'll see that the UV coordinates, which are basically X, Y for each face in this case, um, you can see that there's a corner that's blue or black or whatever that's going to be in each of these places. So there's up here, there's one right here, and there's one down in the bottom left here. And then we've got this green area in all of them. We've got this red area. So you can see this face just kind of rotating and being placed in each place. And that's what the UV coordinates are. So this is if you've ever heard of UV unwrapping, that's uh, roughly what's going on here. So we've got an X and a Y position for every pixel on the or every fragment, actually, on the face of each of the cubes. And thus, we can basically draw a line from zero to one in each of those. And we are doing that here with colors, which gives us the same face rendering on each face, but rotated in different ways. So that's just a bit about uh, the shaders and the kind of values that you get by default from these shaders. Remember, time is something that we're passing in ourselves. So we name that as a uh, uniform and we pass it in with the custom material struct. The custom material struct needs to be defined in both places in Rust and also in our shader. But uh, I really like the effect that we got earlier. So I'm going to, before I commit this so I can set it up for the YouTube video, I'm going to switch us back to what? Value one, value two, value three is what it was because I really like that smooth rainbowness. Yeah, there we go. I really like that smooth rainbowness. So yeah, I hope that you, uh, I hope that you enjoyed this because I am having a blast uh, figuring out how to write shaders at all. This is super new to me. So again, we've got the Perlin noise from the WGSL library that we created in the last video. We've got uh, the world position for each of the fragments. We could use the normals or the UV to do additional manipulation of these values. And of course, we've got the coordinate of the cube itself. Um, so I kind of love this and uh, I hope that you enjoyed it as well. And I will see you in the next video. If you have any kind of uh, questions, I will look them up and throw them in the next shader video. So hop down to the comments. Um, give me a subscribe if you like the video and you want to see more shaders. And I will catch you next time.